There are two ways in which to identify the gluteal tendons on ultrasound. The patient laying on their side, knees and ankles on top of each other. The first method uses the facet anatomy of the trochanter. With the probe in short axis to the femur, if we see the femur flat, we're too low. If we don't see the femur, we're too high. So we want to scan up and down the femur until we see the peak of the trochanter. Now anterior to this peak is the anterior facet and the insertion of glute min. Whilst posterior to this peak is the lateral facet and the insertion of the anterior bundle of glute med and the posterior superior facet which has the insertion of the posterior bundle of glute med. The second method uses the muscle anatomy with the heel of the probe on the greater trochanter and the toe of the probe pointing towards the pubic symphysis. We simply move forward toward the pubic symphysis. We drop our depth and here we can see the lateral aspect of the joint, the glute min muscle and the glute med muscle over the top. From here it's just a matter of moving backwards following the muscle back towards its tendon and to its insertion of the anterior aspect of the greater trochanter or glute min. And with glute med, we can use the fact that it is bipennate and identify the intramuscular tendon and follow this back to its insertion on the lateral facet. For the posterior aspect of glute med, I simply fall off the back of the trochanter to get this image. Now I prefer this method. This method allows assessment of the muscle belly first, which is easier, and fatty atrophy of the muscle is often associated with tendon tears. So in this case, we see first a fatty and atrophic glute min muscle before we see that the tendon is torn and retracted. Now there are a few pitfalls to be aware of. The anatomical bald spot of the trochanter is one of these. Unlike the rotator cuff, the gluteal tendons are segmented and often separated though it's variable, with an anatomical bald spot, or bare spot, which is often misinterpreted as a partial tear of the anterior aspect of glute med. To help differentiate anatomical from pathological, we're looking for irregularity of the enthesis. If we see enthesial irregularity, we're thinking tear. If we see a smooth, bony trochanter, we're thinking a normal anatomical bald spot. So in this case, we can see that there's irregularity of the enthesis, which is more likely to suggest a tear. We also see a large amount of fluid associated with this tear, and the only way we can see this is because of light probe pressure. Another common pitfall is stenographers press too hard. They'll compress the fluid and make it a lot more difficult to identify a torn tendon. The last pitfall is incorrectly identifying the trochanteric bursa. Whatever you do, don't measure this and call it a thicker fluid-filled trochanteric bursa. It's not. This is simply the muscle of glute med. Don't believe me? Read any paper over the past 20 years and they will all essentially conclude the same. Isolated trochanteric bursitis is not a thing. This is one of the more quoted papers on the subject from Bird et al. who concluded that trochanteric bursal distension was uncommon and did not occur in the absence of glute medius pathology. This paper from 2023 even stated that trochanteric bursitis is no longer the preferred term due to the relatively rare occurrence of bursitis on imaging. This histological study with a fabulous title looked at the bursas that had been removed in patients undergoing total hip arthroplasties and under the microscope found no evidence of acute or chronic inflammation. And finally, from 2022, Langer et al. concluded that isolated trochanteric bursitis as the cause of refractory lateral hip pain appears to be rare. Hip abductor tendon pathology has been severely underestimated and a shift in focus towards treatment of these structures is necessary. And something that helped me overcome my immense frustration when it came to the sheer number number of trochanteric bursal injections we do were the words from the guys at MSK Australia who told me don't think of these injections as bursal injections to treat bursitis but rather as peritendinous injections to treat tendinosis and helped me change my entire approach and indeed outlook on ultrasound of the lateral hip and trochanteric bursitis. Thanks for listening guys like and subscribe for more content.